Well, I think this whole approach of we don't, you know, we live in a so-called post-truth era, post-modern deconstructionist era, where figures like Trump can come in and basically create such a chaotic situation um, that he can then actually bend reality to his to his will to his benefit. Well, well, that that's that's what he was taught to do. Exactly, uh, being yeah. a devotee of Norman Vincent Peale. Yeah, and that was actually um, uh, that was like my next line of thought was to actually ask yeah. you because so. I just want to say this really quickly, which is you talk about this individual, uh, yeah, Reverend Norman Vincent Peale as being a major influence in, in Trump and being a part of the new thought or the kind of hmm. uh, positive thinking. Now, my uh, first exposure to this type of thinking was from The Secret, uh, oh, yeah. which yeah, yeah. my father yeah. was super into and he had me watch. I didn't read the book, but I watched the documentary yeah. about it or whatever you want to call it, you know, the little film about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, even as a kid, I was like, this doesn't... Uh, in, the infomercial. The infomercial. There you go. Because they call it a documentary. <laughs> right. doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. But, but just the idea that, you know, you think about something and you think about it positively and you set your will to yep. it, you know, reality will like rearrange itself to accommodate that. And mm. I was like, okay, well, that sounds nice, but... I don't know. It just it just always something felt like was yeah, completely yeah. excluded from the, the 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 whole thing, which was like the systemic reality of the systems we're a part of. Which mm-hmm. you know, like tell a person who's starving to death on the streets yeah, yeah, or whatever, I mean, yeah. like will yeah, yourself yeah. out of this, you know. And it just felt yeah. really wrong to me. But but you get into the deeper roots of this line of thinking. You know, I hadn't known until reading your book that this has been around for some time. This type of thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah, if I could yeah. ask you about that, just ask you about this individual that influenced Trump, uh, and the kind of the the framework, how how it works, how how it what it is as a philosophy or an approach to life, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. kind of the deeper roots of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the, the thing is, it 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 um, yeah, the kind of as we say, practical uh, utilitarian kind of approach to it, where you know you. You you want some outcome, or you know you you whatever it might be from a you know a new washing machine to a better job or something. I mean that in a way is a kind of shallow um, way to approach this. But the notion that in some way our our inner world is um, involved in the world that we we experience outside. Mm-hmm. I mean this has a long sort of philosophical and, and and spiritual prestige and i mean it goes back to emerson you know in, in once i mean it goes back to the ancient greeks and hindu philosophy as well but in american context i mean ralph waldo emerson the great american essayist he actually coined the term new thought mm-hmm. uh and um, he, he has this whole notion about you know um being able to visualize and um create I mean, he doesn't talk about it in that sense, but uh, create your own reality in that kind of sense. But he does talk about the way in which you can have success in the world and, this, and self-reliance. And also the, the notion that our thoughts do sort of shape the world around us mm-hmm. in a certain way. And, you know, Emerson is this quintessential American. It's the new world. He's, you know, he's, cut, he's cut ties with Europe in the past and all that. And so it, it is a very kind of American can-do um, sort of sensibility. And William James, the great American philosopher and, and, and psychologist in the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, uh, uh, it was called the mind cure then. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, sort of a variant of Christian science. But again, it was, you know, the whole notion that what we would call psychosomatic uh, kind of illnesses or, or conditions, um, where um, thinking positive thoughts, thinking in a particular way can actually help someone get over um uh a you know physical malady and um james himself employed some techniques uh because he had angina and a variety of other sort of nervous conditions and and at one point he even lobbied um for uh well he lobbied against um there was the uh, american medical society or something like that in boston wanted to ban access to this kind of mind cure literature because they felt it was a you know a danger to the public and all that and uh james lobbied against that mm. and actually um helped to make it available so it, it has it has some you know and you know, many people Henri bergson the great you know french philosopher in the early 20th century so it, 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 it unless you want to think these people were like you know yeah they were great philosophers but you know boy did they get uh, uh you know the wool pull over eyes over this stuff it does have a prestigious background but yes it is uh, ultimately very simplistic and there's there's dozens of you know um immediate uh, 
uh, questions one asks, just as you said, you know, if it was that easy, wouldn't we, you know, uh, be doing it all the time? Right. But um, where uh, Norman Vincent Peale comes into this is he he grew up, he read a lot of this kind of new thought literature, uh, say late 19th century into the early uh, 20th century. Um, William Walker Atkinson, um, a variety of others. And um, he gave it a kind of Christian um, kind of twist. And uh, he gave these sermons in New York at the uh, Marble Collegiate Church on um, Fifth Avenue and 29th Street. And um, he had a radio program and then a TV program in the 50s. And in the 50s, he wrote, wrote this book called The Power of Positive Thinking. And it became this immense bestseller. And it's still something that sells quite a bit. But it was on the bestseller list for like two years or something like that mm-hmm. over the top of it when it came out. And um, it, it, it's like a, um, a three-part sort of program, you know, where you prayerize, you sort of pray to God, you know, what, what it is that you want uh, to happen. Uh, you visualize it as vividly and clearly as you possibly can, the outcome actually taking place. And then you have to develop <clears throat> this kind of sense of expectancy where it's already happened. You don't actually have to, you know, struggle and, and, and kind of stress, stress yourself to make it happen. It, it's happened already and, you know, it'll, the results of it will turn up soon. Mm-hmm. And um, th- this was um, something that, Peel was able to get across to millions of readers in in, in this simple way, and um, it was something that Trump's father was um, very taken with, and he used to take the family to hear these um, uh, 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 his sermons, Peel sermons, and then Trump himself started going, uh, you know, when he got older, and he had you know two of his weddings took place there, and he <laughs> says that I mean, what what the, uh, this, this is probably the best kind of endorsement you. Uh, you you can get is that he said after listening to one of Norman Vincent Peale's sermons, he could have listened to another one for another hour. And Trump is not somebody who's known for a, a, a very uh, 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 long attention span. Right. So yeah. <laughs> the fact that he would, he'd be able to sit through another hour, that's saying a lot. So, and the fundamental idea that he took away from Peale's books is that um, facts don't matter. It's our attitude towards facts. Mm. This this was something that Peel got from the psychologist Carl Menninger, but it goes back to the ancient Stoic uh, philosoph- philosophers, like Epictetus. It's not things that trouble us; it's what we think about things uh, that trouble us. Right. So you can control your thoughts, and so this is one thing. I mean, Trump he he, he never has a negative word. I mean, he he'll say negative about somebody else. He's gonna you know sure. slow slow Joe or sleepy Joe, or whatever. He's gonna put him down. But everything about him is upbeat. It's the best. It's the greatest. It's the most. The biggest, um, so <laughs> biggest, yeah, exactly. So this is this is, and he has this kind of focused um, tunnel vision, and he says it's a it's a kind of controlled um, neuroses in the sense that he's able to cut out everything else, other uh, except for you know what he wants to happen. He keeps his eyes on the prize, as it were. Right. And this is the one. This is one of the things where you know you can see he just he just deflects everything around him. That is not part of how he sees things, and he and you're exactly right when you said that he he decide he decides what's real. Yeah, and this is why the whole idea of in the early days when people were trying they were flabbergasted that he was lying so much and trying to <laughs> catch him out, and it didn't matter. Yeah, that he lied. He knew he was lying. He 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 was doing absolutely. But he was saying, I I I decide what's real in this town. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, and uh, that's how it is. And so we have the birth of post-truth and alternative fact then. Right. Well, I think there's this thing about um, with the rise of someone like Trump, um, it, it spits in the face of, of uh, I guess, the underlying values of a liberal democracy, which is mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. the idea that, like, uh, I'm probably really oversimplifying this, but the idea that the best ideas will rise to the top. If you have a best argument, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. best kind of set of information and data, and you can argue well. your point well, you will win the debate, and that'll be the thing mm-hmm. that guides, you know, us towards yeah. a better future or whatever. Yeah. So uh, we kind of set up a political system around that idea, <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you have someone like Trump who absolutely doesn't no. care. You. No. Good, you can't good ar- myth. yeah you can't argue with him to convince him of anything and his followers won't well, well, be convinced of well, anything either all, all, all of these other i mean earlier kind of you know strong leaders uh, mm-hmm. um had a myth 
and it, it, it was a um, you know, Hitler, the the race myth, whatever, the master race myth, and and um, Mussolini. It was this the kind of uh, trying to relive ancient Rome, mm-hmm. uh, and um, this is um, something that's part of that 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 sort of political philosophy of of um, the demagogue. Right. Uh, so it isn't about it, it. It isn't about rational argument. And that, see, yeah, you're right. If you assume that this discussion is taking place in a sphere which accepts, you know, the the criteria for rational argument and all that. Right. Right. But once once that once that's gone, then it doesn't matter anymore. Right. And um, it's, it's. I mean, I think the thing with Trump, and this is why I say in the book um, about people like Mussolini and Hitler, and and not 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 to you know make the any kind of relation between them that 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 strong or that or that uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, obvious, but just the sense that um, they they didn't win on rational arguments. They 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 had an emotional appeal. They they fulfilled an emotional need. Yes. They satisfied an emotional need to belong to something. Right. Um, right. And this this is what uh, Trump is doing. You know the MAGA movement and and all that sort of thing. Right, and, and right. This, this again, he's it, it, in in a different way. Putin's sort of doing the, the similar thing. Then it's this not necessarily make Russia great again, but um, he's making all these uh, gestures back towards earlier times, pre-Soviet times in in, in Russia, and trying to regain um, a kind of well. This this is my book, The Return of Holy Russia, is about. Where he's he's been trying to generate a revival of the sense. Of this character that Russia had in the 19th century of Holy Russia, that had this holy mission, you know, mm. it, 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 it was the true carrier of the Christian faith, the true faith, and that's why Russia today is the upholder of traditional values against the decadent, hyper liberal, you know, uh, super permissive West, where everything mm. is available, everything's up for grabs. I mean, reality's up for grabs. Yeah. Here. Yeah. You know. And again, it's not only Trump. I mean, you know, <laughs> the whole gender question and things like that. People can just decide to be a, one gender or the other. And biology is a is a bad word now. Mm-hmm. So again, there's another kind of um, what do you want to call it? Dimension of reality, some you know um, stable, objective, verifiable reality that is um, you know uh, under a cloud now uh, because it it interferes or it oppresses. A notion of people's rights that they have the right to be able to decide what gender they want. And so again, so reality is malleable. Mm-hmm. So it's not only Trump who's doing it; others, you know, uh, in, in different ways are doing it uh, uh, as well. And um, it's just he seems he's just he's the president of the United States, you know. Um, uh, so he's in a position where what he decides to be reality affects uh, you know many many people.